Yeah. And uh, the floor is yours. Or the screen is yours. Super. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Santofimia, for the introduction. Thank you for for the people that invited me to the, to give the to present my work in this uh, in this framework. Uh, what I'm going to present today is about Martin City transformation in steel. I'm not going to introduce myself again because I just I just got introduced. Um, so first of all, where do I sit when uh, when I do my research? Uh, my scientific environment. We are we are in the main campus of the Technical University of Denmark. Uh, that is situated a little bit north of Copenhagen. Uh, I stay in the group of materials uh, and surface engineering uh, down there. This is, is a small group uh, in, um, inside the Department of Civil and Mechanical Engineering. Uh, the, the full group is made of eight faculties, three researchers, and 20 plus between postdoc and PhDs. And uh, apart from atmospheric transformation and steel, my research work is a little bit broader. Uh, it's on solid state transformation in metallic material. And I, I work mainly with the five people that, that I present, uh, that I report here in the slide uh, on the top right. But actually, many other have been contributed to, to this presentation, to the presentation that I'm giving today. And I think it was important to start acknowledging uh, that there is a a big number of people that have contributed with their, their expertise to, to what I'm going to present. And uh, you will see them appearing uh, here and there in, in, uh, as references when I'm going to present my, my, my work later on. Um, so I think that was the important point to start. Then the question is about solid state transformation in metallic material. And uh, what, what is the most the most studied uh, transformation in metallic material, I think, is the hardening of steel. Steel somehow has, uh, has shaped, I will say, the, the development of, uh, of, of our, our techno technological de development as human in the last three, four millennia, three millennia. Uh, and when, when we go why steel has, has a, acquired more and more importance in, uh, in our society, uh, it's because we can make it art. Uh, the the eye strength, the eye hardness of steel has been has been what what attracted uh, people for for a long time. On top of the fact that steel can be made in a cheap way, uh, and and also it's formable, so there are a lot of nice characteristics. But what was very attractive was was the strength. And now we develop strength. Uh, well, in a few centuries from when when iron uh, was introduced as a as a material for for construction. Uh, well, people already knew how to make strength, uh, how to make iron strong. You have to quench it. Uh, and this was already the first the first reference to it. We have it in the Odyssey. So really one of the first textbook that we can we can have uh, in, human, in human history. And nowadays we made we made it very far from uh, from just understanding that you have to quench steel in water in order to get it out. So you can actually present it at university and also at the various level uh, in, in a very, I would say, effective way because we could, we could just present uh, the hardening in terms of a CCT diagram like the one that is reported here. And then we can plot the hardness of the material. Uh, this is a low, low alloyed steel, uh, if I remember correctly. And you see that on the on the left side, so uh, in the diagram, so the, when we are actually applying an, a fast cooling rate, uh, we are actually having high air hardness values. The hardness goes down the more you go on the left uh, on this diagram. So we start maybe from 450 vehicles down to 250. And this is because when we cool down very fast, we get Martensite as a product, uh, as a microstructure inside inside the material. So if we have now austenite as the phase at high temperature and we cool down fast, we get a martensitic structure, providing that we go fast enough in cooling. So we have to exceed a certain critical cooling rate in order to get martensite. If we don't do that, then we get other products that are softer. How do we make how do we make it easy for us to reach this critical cooling rate, well, we can increase hardenability of the steel by, for example, introducing more carbon that will actually shift the other curve to longer time. Carbon increases hardenability of steel, of, of iron, also because it increases the strength of the martensite. So here is a, I just wanted to start reporting the hardness of martensite or of a material, martensitic material versus carbon content, the square root of the carbon content. You see that at the beginning, we have an increase in hardness that goes together with the square root of carbon, but also that actually when you go too far in carbon, you get a decrease in hardness. And this is because at one point, the martensitic transformation will be suppressed by the effect of carbon in, the, in lowering the transformation 
temperature. We also teach to students that we have different type of martensite. We have laugh martensite when we have low carbon. This is an extremely good microstructure because it's not only strong if you have a little bit of carbon in it, but it's also very ductile. So you have a high toughness and high strength at the same time. And this is what makes it good for construction material. But when we also go at higher carbon, we have a different type of product. We have plate martensite that is brittle. And actually, it's, uh, it's a product that is, instead of filling up the full standard grain, actually partition it. So it's also difficult for the transformation to go to completion. That is also a little bit linked to why the hardness goes down. So retaining those standard is there. That is a soft, a soft product. If we want to do one more step in the introducing uh, steel and martensite in steel to students, well, we can actually say that there is love, but there is many different types of plates. So plate is not only plate. You have thin plate, lenticular, you have bands along 111 when you have epsilon martin said you have very uh, morphologically uh, not, not as, let's say morphologically difficult to have a, uh, in, in one way only plates like the true true five that can be a butterfly type of small units, larger units of so very, very, very large variation in morphology. And whatever we want to refer to the to the characteristic of the various plates, we can just define it by the orbit plane. So we will have some characteristic that is, a, uh, as I was saying, the morphology, but also whether the interface is straight or whether the interface is is not straight. And we can directly relate it to the to the uh, to the orbit plane of the martensite. So the main plate in the cryostenite crystal where the martensite unit are, are located. This is about morphology and microstructure. But there is one characteristic that is even more important. The most important characteristic of martensite in steel, and actually martensite in general, is that it can form at very, very, very low temperature. For example, at 4 Kelvin. And from here, everything else comes, like the fact that the interface is glissile, and then that the transformation has to be line invariant, and everything else we can teach to students about the crystallography of martensite, and the fact that it can grow very fast and that the interface can move very, very, very fast. Uh, why this is the most important characteristic? Well, because it allows us also to define Martin set against all the other transformation that we can observe uh, in, uh, in steel, but also in other materials. So on one side, we have now the, all the thermally activated transformation, like the one I reported here. And the characteristic of the thermally activated is that you can suppress them if you cool very fast. We have seen it before in the CCT diagram but also that you can proceed with time because since you actually have some thermal activation needed, they, they, they may need some time for them in order to get to a point where the transformation is actually able to proceed to completion. On the other side, you have the thermal, Martin City transformation. They can form a four Kelvin, so you cannot suppress it. Doesn't matter how fast you go. At one point, when you reach a certain point where the transformation will be able to occur, it will occur, no matter what you do there. So you cannot suppress them. And clearly at the moment you reach a certain temperature, you will actually reach a situation in which the Martin set is able to, to reach the maximum level of transformation that, that could reach with the available driving force. And so you have to increase the, 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 the driving force, so reduce the temperature further in order to get more transformation. So far it seems very, very easy. First challenge comes when you report that Martin set can form isothermally in model alloys, in commercial steel. In both cases, you actually have that the transformation progress versus time. So can be suppressed and pro pro proceed versus as a function of time. So actually now we just finish saying that Martin set is put, put it on one side against all the thermal activated transformation that can be suppressed and proceed, of, uh, proceed versus time. And now we are showing that this is not true. It's a little bit confusing already, but we have an escape we can actually not panic yet if, if a student come out with, uh, with uh, this graph showing that Martin set can form isothermally because we have an explanation. We can say, well, there is a critical driving force to form Martin set. You can increase the driving force by reducing the temperature. When you reach to a, the critical driving force at a certain temperature, you get the Martin set transformation, Martin set start temperature. What if you don't reach the critical driving force? Well, if you don't reach the critical driving force, you have an energy barrier. So you have thermal activation. So at that point, we can actually explain a C curve in a TTT diagram. So it is a thermal Martin City transformation as an thermal transformation where the critical driving force has not been reached. 
So far, we are still somehow in business. Where we don't go any longer in business with this kind of description, that is the one we, I, I believe still nowadays we give as a main description in all, in all our courses, is where we present the work from Mirzayev and uh, Mirzayev from the 80s mainly, and was repeated also by Wilson in the 90s. Uh, what they show there is that they took pure iron and they show that when you actually cool down iron very, very, very fast, like above 100,000 degrees per second, this you may think, okay, it's unreasonable to reach that cooling rate. Actually, the, the most modern uh, um, technology for production of components in metallic material reach that cooling rate, but that's a different story. Uh, anyway, when you cool down very, very fast, suddenly you have not only one type of martensite, you have two types of martensite, and you can actually suppress the laugh and get the plate. So suddenly martensite is also suppressible, and, uh, and it's also not one, it's two in a single material. So no longer the chemistry define which type of, which type of matter cell we get, but it defines uh, also the cooling rate will play a role here. So if we go back to the CCT diagram of before, now we are showing a critical cooling rate to suppress laugh matter set and get plate matter set. So we have one line more there in the diagram. And very, very interesting here is that the critical cooling rate depends on the carbon content logarithmically in pure iron. So now actually also with the description of carbon as increasing our denability that we had before, uh, as an ability to essentially push binite and ferrite transformation at longer time, is actually true also for laugh martens So laugh martens somehow move it around there. And if we present the true transformation of before, the thermal activated on one side, and they are thermal on the other, actually now martensite moves or at least divides it into two. We now have love martensite that is thermally activated and we have plain martensite that is real martensite. This is a description that uh, was first pointed out by the Russians mainly in the 70s, 80s uh, and actually really rationalized by Zion Notice. The, the work on Zion Notice, the review work in the 95 was probably the most, the, the right reference to give here, but. Anyway, I gave my Mirzayev at this point. And how can we contribute at this point in, uh, as a research that we have done at DTU? So, so far we were just introducing. Now let's see what we have done. And just to say, there is, there is then some interpretation that we have to put in place. And, uh, and starting from there, we wanted, to do, we wanted to do some experiment. What we have applied a lot at DTU to in order to contribute and go further in this, in this kind of description and understanding what, what is really going on there is to use magnetometry. So magnetometry was that you have a sample. We did it in a way that the sample is fully martensitic and austenitic, so we don't have carbides or other elements that can disturb our, our study of the transformation. You put it in between two coils, you turn on the magnetic field so you can magnetize the sample. You can have a chamber to control the temperature versus time. And then you can actually exploit the magnetic properties of iron, the fact that austenite is paramagnetic if you don't have too much nickel and other alloying elements, but it's paramagnetic. And martensite like ferrite is ferromagnetic in order to actually get an excellent signal in terms of how much you can follow the transformation. And this is because when you magnetize a ferromagnetic material, ferromagnetic iron, you get a magnetic moment that is 10 to the power of four higher than when you just magnetize a paramagnetic material. So you can actually see 0.01% transformation with this technique. And this is a first proof of it that was done before I actually came to DTU. Uh, the, first, the first experiment was from 2006 uh, and reported in 2011 in, uh, in under chrome 6. You can see on the vertical axis, the retained austenite in this, in this material, commercial material used for bearings versus temperature. So what was done was that the material take it at room temperature was cooling down in the instrument, cooling. You see the reduction of retained austenite there. Then they apply the certain isothermal holding. And you can see the reduction of retained austenite. Look at the scale here. We are talking about 1%, in total 5% from the beginning to the end of the cycle. And you can really see how accurately you can follow the transformation. And on eating as well. As well. So actually now already we have even more complication. We can show that Martin cell can form on eating. This is a little bit counterintuitive as compared to what, what we have before. Martin cell can form on cooling, isothermal holding and eating. So far only some curve um, and, and very nice results in terms of what can be seen 
Uh, but what I think pushed us very, very far in, in, in understanding more of what was, what was going on in the material is by applying two specific type of experiments that actually we applied almost 10 years after the first experiment was done. The first is isothermal experiment. What we did here is that we started with quenched material at room temperature. We put it in boiling nitrogen, up quench to the isothermal transformation temperature and follow the isothermal transformation. And the second type of experiment is continuous heating experiment. In this case, we go from room temperature down to boiling nitrogen, and then we continuously heat the sample back to room temperature. How does this relate to what we have seen before? Well, we can present it as a TTT diagram here, for example. So this is the kind of experiments you quench, up quench, and follow isothermally. You see each single data point in terms of also time here presented on the background. And what you see is the typical C-shaped curve for isothermal transformation. This is a, a steel that is a pH steel, 17.7 pH, uh, that is actually uh, hardened by holding in, the, in dry ice for eight hours, uh, also in uh, technologically done in that way. So industrially it's done in that way from the 70s. So we were actually, we, we knew that this was a good way to transform the material. And so far it's just the, C, the C-shaped curve that we have seen, for example, a few slides before. TTT diagram, this is nothing else than that. But we can also have now an isochronal uh, transformation when we continuously heat up. So it's essentially a continuous heating transformation diagram for following the martensitic transformation in iron. So here is a little bit the opposite of a continuous cooling transformation diagram. You see austenite on the bottom, martensite on the top. And we're actually then a little bit flipping around the concept of what we have seen and what we are teaching to students a lot. Just to make it even clearer that it's a little bit the opposite of a continuous cooling transformation diagram when we go for continuous eating, I just plotted the hardness of the material on top. Here is a little bit of the opposite side of the time scale as well here. So you see that this, the material is soft when you warm up fast and it's hard when you warm up slow. And this is because when you warm up fast, austenite remains austenite. When you warm up slow, austenite becomes Martin said. Let's follow it step by step, because I think it's, it's very important here to clarify what we have done in order to get this diagram. Let's take a slightly different material, 15.7 pH. You see there in the micrograph, you have some delta ferrite, and not only austenite and martin said, you see it in band actually the, the, on there, uh, down there. So now we start with some magnetic signal already to start with after room temperature quenching from the high temperature. And then we can put it in boiling nitrogen. This is a material where Martin said is suppressible. So nothing happened. Then you can warm it up slowly. And you completely can transform the, the, the austenite into Martin said if you go 0, 0.5 degrees per minute. You can go 10 degrees per minute or many different eating rates. You will see that the faster you go, the more you shift the transformation temperature to higher temperature. And the more you have less, the, the more the transformation is actually not longer. Complete. You can actually also just up quench in boiling water and then leave it there at room temperature. And then you will see that you actually can almost fully suppress the transformation. So, this is what we have plotted before for the 17.7. It's slightly different material. This is the 15.7 uh, in, in terms of continuous heating transformation, transformation diagram. What about other type of steel? Because these are two very particular steel where we, we were pretty convinced that we would have observed something like that. But let's take, for example, uh, a martensitic stainless steel, again, 17% chromium. So very close to the steel bef of before. 17% chromium, a little bit less nickel than before. Before we were having 7% nickel, now we have 2%, but a bit more carbon. So now we are using carbon instead of nickel in order to stabilize austenite at room temperature. And indeed, we start with a fully austenitic material. Then we put it in boiling nitrogen, and uh, this behaves a little bit differently than before, because now we have 30% of the austenite that transform into martensite when reaching boiling nitrogen temperature. This is just immersion in boiling nitrogen. It's the same that we have applied before, but suddenly in this material, the martensite is not suppressible. It's a little bit more classical. Now it's what we would expect if the martensite's temperature lies somewhere in between room temperature and boiling nitrogen temperature, that, that some martensite will form if we cool down very, very fast. Little bit less classical is that when we warm up, depending on the heat rate, or if we up quench in water again, we can have transformation during eating, or we can 
not have transformation during it. Well, a little bit is there anyway, but the majority of it is utterly suppressed. So we have a part of a transformation now in this material that is insuppressible and a part of the transformation that is suppressible. We can do this for many different materials because we like to be systematic. We like to show the full systematic way and what will happen when we, when we change chemistry. So we can take iron nitrogen. We can take iron carbon binary. We can take uh, under chrome 6, so 1% chromium, 1.5% chromium, 1% carbon, 12% stainless steel, chromium stainless steel, 15% chromium stainless steel, 17% chromium stainless steel. So a little bit we are trying to cover the full the full, uh, the full panorama, the full uh, possibilities that we can get in terms of, uh, of, of steel grades out there on the shelf. And what have we observed when we did this kind of con quenching and a continuous sitting? Well, we have observed that we have the two type of kinetics that I just showed. We have some materials where everything is suppressible or almost suppressible. And we have some material that, well, we cannot really suppress the transformation on cooling. So we have a kinetic type one and a kinetic type two, depending on the chemistry of the material. This is the type one and two reported in this column here. And just to make it clear, type one, suppressible Martensen, type two is partially not suppressible transformation. Then we can try to link this kind of kinetics to what we see in the material or in the Martensen. So for example, we could look at the substructure. Plate Martensen is generally or fully twinned or partially twinned. We also have plates that are actually the one that can form in stainless steel that are slippered. So completely uh, as a substructure we're made of this location. Uh, and we can see here that, well, the twins are not there when we have kinetic type one, but you can also have a completely, a fully dislocated uh, Martin set and every kinetic type two. So the substructure does not really make the difference here. What seems to make the difference is the morphology. So if we take the typical Laff Martin set, the one that we have in low carbon steel, uh, and in the majority of structural steel that we that of the, of the steel that we actually do use, the five five seven type, just to make it clear, then we have the kinetic type one. Whatever else we see in the material, that could be a combination of Laff and lenticular plate Martin set, the bend along one 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 that then with an epsilon as a, as an intermediate product. Whatever else is kinetic type two. I want to be extremely clear here again, just to make sure that we are fully on board. It doesn't matter if it's partially insuppressible. Partially exactly means that if you look what is happening during eating in all the material, all from the first to the last that we investigated, you will form Martin said during eating. Then you may have transformation on cooling. In this case, we have a partial insuppressible transformation, or you may have transfer no transformation on cooling at all. And in that case, it's a fully suppressible transformation. But in all of them, you have a part that is suppressive, at least a part. Why this is important? Well, because if now we have this kind of a suppressible transformation in all of them, and we have done the right experiments to study the kinetics, uh, we could actually measure the activation energy for the suppressible Martin set and take it in all the material, independent of which kind of material we have. We have plate Martin set, we have Laff Martin set. We can use all the data anyway to look for the activation energy for suppressible transformation. How do you do it? Well, different eating rates. You take a constant fraction transform. You read the temperature where this fraction is reached during eating. So it's just the delta fraction, the fraction that has formed during eating only. Then you plot it in the way that is reported uh, here. And if you assume that this in the light kinetics, you get the activation energy there of the transformation. And we can do it for the 12 material that we have done. We put it together actually with some literature data, a work done from uh, at KTH uh, 15 years ago. What, and we tried to plot around to see a little bit what we could link uh, between the activation energy. The activation energy is between, let's say, five, seven, actually it was the value from Borges and Lindler, and 25 kilojoule per mole. Uh, and what we see is that, well, there is some kind of dependency maybe on the interstitial content. Uh, they are more or less the same independently whether we have Laff or whether we have plate Martin set. But we, I would say from what we get here, we cannot really conclude, for example, if there is a log dependence. We get a bit farther if we take all the literature data and we plug, plug them in. So we apply the analysis by, by uh, that as was done in, uh, in, uh, in Stockholm, 
But instead of putting together all the all the literature that is out there, we just took the data one by one, paper by paper, and we tried to plot. And then we see an activation energy that depends logarithmically on the fraction of the interstitials. Again, this is not only for laugh, this is for all suppressible part of transformation independent in the morphology. Fascinating, fascinating enough, enough, if we go back to one of the initial slides of this presentation, the critical cooling rate to suppress laugh matters it was also depending on the carbon content and with a log, a log dependence. So there may be something there. We haven't done the mathematics to discover if we can do some more modeling here. And also I, I will say, it would be important when we talk about activation energy to say a little bit more words about what is the rate controlling mechanism. I will leave it in standby because I think we have something more important to talk about first. That is the classification. Because before I started, before the presenting the work done at BTU, I started by saying, okay, maybe we have Love Martin set up as a thermal activated and Plate Martin set down as a thermal. Well, now we have already discovered that we should maybe say suppressible Martin set up as thermal activated and in suppressible Martin set down as a thermal, because we can have suppressible Martin set also in plate Martin set. Just the fact that in plate Martin set, you have a part that is in suppressible. But let's have a look a little bit more what is suppressible. So, so far as a lot of kinetics looks, let's look at some microstructure or some uh, micrographs at least. Let's start from laugh Martin set because it's where we have seen that we can suppress everything. And let's see what happened if we follow isothermally the transformation. I wanted to report here what can be done isothermally at room temperature, because I think it's the most fascinating. You can easily show it also in the classroom. So this makes it even more fascinating to me. What we have done is that we took a 15% chromium steel and we tailored the heat stability by the nitrogen content in the steel. So we introduced a nitrogen at high temperature, quenched to room temperature in order to get metastable austenite, put it in the microscope and follow the transformation. This is one micrograph per minute done in the optical microscope. I will just show it twice. So we start with a cl cluster of martensite unit and the cluster grows more and more units versus time. So somehow it looks like the time dependency of laugh martensite is a time dependent growth of clusters of martensite. Actually, if we look a little bit more in depth, it's a time dependent growth of each of the unit that made up a cluster. So somehow now we don't have enough magnification in this, uh, in this micrograph in order to see whether we are dealing about, most likely we are dealing about block, blocks of matter that are actually growing versus time. Uh, but we can see at least that uh, there is some time dependent growth that is probably what we can suppress then. Uh, and this is actually dependent, uh, the, uh, happening at various scale. We, we have to do more work there to really see what is actually growing. Um, but just to convince you a little bit more and to say a little bit more that is fascinating to show it, we can also take a video. And when we take a video, it's even more evident that we have growth that is time dependent. This was done with my cell phone just in front of some students, uh, just putting the cell phone in front of the screen of the computer. So nothing high tech. Uh, but very fascinating because suddenly we are we are teaching about steel something that is very let's call it, let's say that it's cold and it seems alive in the screen. It's, I think it's very nice to to, to show this kind of images. Uh, but what about plate? So this was Laugh Martin said. Let's let's move at plate. Well, I have shown you before this kinetic this image is about transformation in a 17 chrome uh, zero four percent carbon. Uh, and here I think we have the perfect system to also check. In plate martin said, what is suppressible and what is not? So let's have a look at the material that was just quenched and upquenched. So here is just unsuppressible, insuppressible martin said. And you see thin plate martin said. This is the typical aspect of thin plate martin said. You have some plates, very, very thin, parallel interface, flat interface with the austenite. Or we can just warm up slower. And then we see that we have a bit more units. So the number of units increases, but also the thickness of the units increases. So somehow we also have here some time dependent growth of plate. And again, the growth of the plate seems to be what is more, uh, what is actually suppressible by, by warming up very, very fast. Um, actually, there were already some indication from the first, first time that lenticular versus thin plate was reported in the 66. This is a work from Patterson and Weimar. Well, you can really see the internal, the flat area that is typical of thin plate martens that they, they touch each other in the two plates. And then there was some growth that evidently was a little bit time dependent happening afterwards. 
and you see that the growth is actually intersecting the, the ring part of the plate. Uh, one more remark here, the twinned area then is the nucleus somehow, what seems to be insuppressible, and the part that makes the lenticular Martin said, then starting from the tin plate, twin internally twinned to the lenticular, so internally slippered, is what it's actually looking like, uh, needing some time to, to grow. Uh, there was also the Russians that were reporting the same in the 70s. That is a very fascinating experiment. They started by a magnetic pulse to nucleate Martin set, tin plate Martin set, and then they saw that it was evolving into lenticular over time at boiling nitrogen temperature. Uh, and also in the Chuchu 5 type plate, you have a little bit the same that this is not a direct evidence actually, but uh, that if you keep the material very small amount of time below room temperature, you form small plates, fully twinned. If we actually allow more time, you get a little bit of slipped area and bigger units. So somehow the, suppress the suppressible growth of plates is a little bit linked between fully twinned versus only partially twinned uh, plate uh, of Martens. So coming back to the description and to the images that we had at the beginning uh, by Marky, now we can say, okay, suppressible Martenset is love Martenset. Insuppressible Martenset is tin plate Martenset. I'm not gonna talk more about epsilon, otherwise I can spend the talk in two hours. So this is the idea. Um, and then we can also have suppressible Martenset on insuppressible Martenset. This is the case of the 225 and the 259. So in this case, the lenticular, the lenticular Martenset in the second case. Uh, well, and then when you start to understand this kind of thing, so actually to have indication in this, um, that this may be the case, you can go down in uh, again reading the literature and you will always discover that maybe somebody did it already or uh, actually somebody maybe presented already. And uh, the description is from 66. So somehow I will say uh, we forgot something done in the 60s, but I think that this time we are a little bit more, uh, more prepared to, to make it, to make it uh, remaining in, uh, in, uh, in the description and make it maybe to the book of Martin said. Um, now, if we actually look also in the way that the two different suppressible and insuppressible Martin said are described or, or what the kind of observation we had in, uh, in DTU, uh, actually there is not very far from what Nishiyama in the seventies in, uh, in, the, in the Bible of Martin said, the big book from Nishiyama was describing as, as Shibu and Unklap uh, Martin said. So here I take some uh, poetic uh, uh, license and I will change suppressible and insuppressible into suppressible and unsuppressible. Uh, because I think it just remind a little bit all the literature putting it together. So I will call it further on S Martin said for suppressible and U Martin said for insuppressible. And this is the same description I presented before. Now we have S Martin said thermal activated, U Martin said a thermal that is, is put it down there. Uh, I left it hanging this, the rate controlling mechanism. So the activation energy was 22, maybe five to 20 uh, kilojoule per mole. Now, if we if we look up what people have suggested before, and this was actually Borg and Tamanilla doing it, uh, they were suggesting, well, this cannot be related to anything else than the movement of this location. Uh, and if we look at the movement of this location, well, we may have two uh, point that we have to look at. One could be the accommodation in Austin. So it could be that there is some need of plastic accommodation in Austin um, for Martin set formation and growth. And this could be the rate determining step for suppressive Martin set. Or it could be that the interface is not glissile. Well, we can we can look up the literature. We can go looking for what has been observed in various characteristics of the various type of Martin set. The first and most important, I will say, can it form at four Kelvin? Well, if we look at all the Martin said that it's fully twinned. For all of them, there is a report saying it can form a 4 Kelvin. For all of them, you can always find, you can also find the report saying they can form instantaneously. This makes absolutely sense. So growth will be instantaneous. And the substructure can be slipped or twinned. Accommodation can be elastic or plastic in Austinet. Well, but it can form a 4 Kelvin. We have no doubt about the interface. It must be glissile. What about Laugh Martin said? Well, the lowest temperature were the 557 type Martin said, the one looking like the technological Martin said. The lowest temperature where this has been reported is 80 Kelvin. Uh, so it cannot form a 4 Kelvin. Actually, there is no really a report that is bulletproof against saying that it can form instantaneously. Um, it, it formed with plastic accumulation in Austin. So this could be one of the reasons. Could be that you need to move some dislocation in Austin in order to 
to actually be able to form this macrocyte. This is also the case for the lenticular, uh, the, the slipped area of the lenticular macrocyte, the slipped area of the true true five uh, macrocyte. Could also be the interface, the point. Uh, there is a report from uh, Fumurara Group in Japan, from Macri Group actually at that time, uh, claiming that lenticular macrocyte, the slipped area is a sessile interface with Fostanet. I think it's, nobody did it again. So we, I would say it's very luckily, it, it would be nicely to, to have more evidence about it. Uh, there are both claim of sessile and uh, glissile interface uh, on the on the laugh martin set, but actually microscopy wise, I didn't find the bulletproof of any of the two. So it could be that is the interface that is actually uh, important here. Okay, presentation got stuck for a moment, but restarted. Um, so in conclusion, I got to the conclusion at this point. The first point, what we classify as Martin set is two different type of transformation product. We have U Martin set and we have S Martin set. We have talked along, along the presentation what are the characteristics, so, and you can read it in the screen, so I will not read directly the conclusion. Uh, what else we have seen is that S Martin set can be can form independently as Laf Martin set, but can also grow on U Martin set. We have information about the activation energy for S Martin set formation and the dependency on carbon or on interstitial cycle. And it could be at least there is some claims that maybe the what is what is rate controlling the formation of S Martin set is the movement of the interface. But I will say this is something that we should look at in the future even even more. There is a fifth point. And here I come back to one stuff that I didn't talk before. That is, what about nucleation of S. Martin said? There's still, there's still, this image, you have seen it before. So this is a, 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 a material that formed Laugh Martin said, and where the transformation is suppressive. So what we can do is that we can do the typical TTT diagram and see what how the kinetics looks like. Well, we have C curves. Now, if we have some athermal nucleation, it means that if we now go farther down in temperature and up again, this curve will change. And this is what we have tested. So somehow now when we put it in boiling nitrogen and up again to the same temperature, now the kinetics are different. And you see that we can move the nose of the curve to higher temperature. This is typically leading to, to the information that this, there is some nucleation happening in the down and up. There is a little bit of transformation happening. We can see that it's maybe less than 1% is happening in the quench up quench. So maybe there is something forming there. And we can actually also look what it is that is forming there. Slightly different still, 17.7. I'm mixing up 15.7 and 17.7, one and the other slide, just because we don't have data for everything in old material. So we start from room temperature. We have some matters. We down quench, a little bit of transformation, up quench. Here we actually can continue the transformation isothermal at room temperature. So we can look at what is happening. This is the isothermal at room temperature. So we actually have formed something sub-zero that in a material that for two months has stayed on my desk, now is forming 20% Martin said, we'll warm up again, again on my desk, but in 20 minutes. So we have done something with the quenching up quenching. What? Well, this is the looking of the material before the quenching up quenching, some cluster of Martin said. This is how it looks after quenching up quench. More cluster of martens. And this is how it looks half an hour later. Bigger cluster of martens. So somehow we have nucleated some cluster by quenching down and up quenching. And we have activated some growth of this cluster that now can proceed because now we have the nuclei active. That was not the case at, at the beginning of, of uh, the investigation. So somehow we have some thermal nucleation plus time dependent growth of F as Martin said, that this is the last conclusion that I wanted to report. Looking at the future. So this is what we have done so far, and I will keep it very, very short. Uh, the idea at this point is how do we make it in a way that we don't forget about this information for other 60 years? Uh, and this is even more difficult than doing the investigation is to uh, make other people aware of, uh, of, of what is actually there or maybe communicate it in an effective way. What we try to do is maybe we could actually communicate in a graph like this. This is done in, in a publication we, we pointed out in 2020, where we actually push it, Laugh Martin set up in a, divi in a divided C-shaped curve as compared to the unsuppressible. Uh, I like it to call it massive 
Martin said versus insuppressible Martin said. We could also say massive Martin said against Martin City Martin said. Maybe it's even to make it clearer. Uh, and I like the definition massive because laugh Martin said and massive Martin said when when the classification was done in the seventy one uh, by. <laughs> Well, I will come back to who. Um, in the 71 was done the classification, there was actually a request to various Shantis. How do you want to call Laugh Martin said and how do you want to call Plate Martin said? And Laugh and Plate are the one that won at that time, but Massive got very, very close to Laugh uh, and gives much more an idea of something thermally activated. Uh, so this could be a division, but in order to really make it uh, in a way that people will remember, we have to show that these two nodes are separated. So we have to show suppressible Martin set as really a, a C shape in the same material where we have unsuppressible, where unsuppressible will be unsuppressible, providing that you reach the critical driving force. What can we do? And clearly, unsuppressible is the real Martin set. Can form a for Kelvin, the interface is good side. We have talked about it before. So we can take a material that has love Martin set. Too many clicks. Uh, and we can put a little bit of nitrogen. What happened when we put a bit of nitrogen? I already mentioned a little bit before, we can stabilize it. So you see now we have 90% also retained also at room temperature. We can cool down. It will form matters. We can put more nitrogen. Then we get fully austenitic. And then the more the nitrogen, the more we put down the transformation temperature and the more we put down the fraction transform. So we actually, and this is because at, at DTU, we have fantastic facility to synthesize this kind of material. So we can control, you can see we go from 0.08% nitrogen to 0.22. And we can do many, 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 many different steps with very, very little nitrogen content difference. Systematically, we can vary the temperature where we want. And we know in this material, I didn't report in the presentation that with this transition in nitrogen, we also have a transition between lath and plate. So we have a perfect system to do the investigation. We also have a perfect system to prove that when you don't reach the critical driving force, you will need some isothermal time in order to activate the first nuclei. And this is exactly what we have proven here. For example, if we put it a little bit too much nitrogen, you can arrive at boiling nitrogen with no martensite, wait 10 minutes and martensite will fall. We can also form martensite only on eating. That is also very fascinating. So this is according to the book. But what we are really interested in is what happens if we go slower than 10 k per minute, for example. Now you see that the kinetics that was only one curve there, now there are two curves. Maybe it's laugh and plate. Well, Bazit is working on it, so I, I still has one and a half year of PhD to work. So I, I hope that soon we are going to get out with some, some uh, work in which we can really prove that we are, we are dealing with different kinetics for different products in the same material. And this is 17.4 pH steel, so a commercial steel that everybody's working on, especially additive manufacturing people nowadays. So it's a very, very hands-on material that, that, that is relevant technologically. To really conclude, and this is the last slide, so it's a real conclusion. I think it was important to conclude without words because I'm talking from 45 minutes and I have to keep you awake at this point. Um, so I decided to go for a graphical conclusion. The first could be this, diagram, I think uh, you should be familiar with it at this point. We are claiming essentially that we have S Martin set as a thermal activated transformation, and we have U Martin set as an thermal real Martin City transformation. That we are trying, uh, we, we can actually provide some information. We, I think we reached some understanding of, of how this kinetics is linked to the morphology, so the, to the real microstructure that we see in the material. S Martin set is Love Martin set, U Martin set is Plate Martin set, Tim Plate at least. And then we can have morphology of Martin set where we have both the existence of U and S Martin set. And the nucleation of S Martin set is a thermal. And then we have the spread of a nucleus along the other, uh, the, the neighbor, uh, the neighbor austenite grains. So this is this is all for the presentation. If you, I provided just a fast link if you want to look up information in the, uh, from from what we have published, just there is, just scan your phone and this will go directly to my ORCID profile, so you can get all information needed in order to 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 find all the publications that are relevant for for this talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. I see a lot of hands. First, I'm going to stop the recording. Yeah.